Please welcome Group Chief Executive Technology and Chief Technology Officer, Accenture, Paul Doherty. Well, good morning, Oracle Cloud World. As, as uh, Safra said earlier, it's great to be in person and be together and be in an event where we can all uh, spend personal time together after uh, the virtual times we've been in. So it's great to be here today. And it's great to be at Oracle Cloud World. Uh, I've been partnering with Oracle for uh, as long as I can remember. And uh, their amazing technology is so important to what we're doing, what all of us are doing in our companies, regardless of the industries we work in. And it's uh, really a pleasure to be talking today a little bit about you know, what you see on the screen here. I'm going to talk a little bit about the metaverse. Uh, I'm also going to talk about uh, tomorrow and where technology is going tomorrow and then bring it back to today and what we need to be thinking about today as we look at our businesses, as we look at technology, as we look at Oracle technology and how it's powering uh, what we do. And I'm going, to be, I'm going to start off for you today. So you have me uh, at the start and I'm going to talk to you for a little while, a little bit more about tomorrow and maybe challenge the thinking a little bit and talk uh, about some views that may be a bit provocative about the future. And then uh, after, uh, after that, I'll be joined by Emma McGuigan of Accenture and Amir Aruni of Discover, who are going to talk a little bit about more about bridging today to tomorrow and how you get there. So I think we're going to have a, a great range and set of topics to talk about. But if you think about technology, and we had some great, a great start today. I love the keynote with Safra and the, everything from uh, Jensen, from NVIDIA to Deutsche Bank and racing and toys, everything we, we talked about. Uh, there was really great stories on how businesses are transforming with technology. And one of the things we're seeing in this uncertain world that we live in, with a lot of uncertainties around the economy, politically, wars, uh, you know, inflation, potential recession, is the role that technology plays. And that's what we hear as we work with, with our customers is the role that technology plays in their future, which is leading to companies to depend on technology in different ways. And that's, uh, if you just look at this, you kind of see some of that playing out. If you just read, you know, just scan through the tiles on the screen, in the top left you'll see you know, political unrest, war in Ukraine, supply chain disruptions, inflation at the, at the gas pumps, uh, you know, the, the war for talent that we have that I'll come back and talk about. And then you start seeing the promise of technology. The center tile is a company called Aero Farms, new sustainable high yield urban uh, production of, of, uh, of food and produce. You see uh, electric uh, scooters you know, eliminating emissions and waste self-driving cars uh, yeah, and uh, on the bottom right you see the the project which launched the uh, the uh, rocket that intercepted the uh, satellite uh, in outer space and re you know, redirected the asteroid you know so we launched the dart program a satellite guided by technology that actually redirected the course of, a, of an asteroid showing a promise in defending the Earth in the future. So amazing technology and that blend of you know, the need for resilience because of the challenges around us and the power and promise of technology is the theme of what I'm going to talk about. And when we look forward at, uh, you know, at, at uh, what's shaping business over the next decade, we really think about five forces that are gonna shape the next decade. And I'm gonna drill in and spend a little bit more time on metaverse, because I think that's probably the most misunderstood of the technologies that's out there today. But I'll, I'll quickly go through each of these five things. And what I'd say is that uh, the next decade, and Jensen you know, from NVIDIA talked about this on stage just a little while ago, the next decade will have more potential and more change from a technology perspective than what we've seen before. And I would say that the next decade will, trans, will, will have more transformative technology, more disruptive technology in the next decade by 2030 than we've had in the prior two decades. And if you think that two decades ago we didn't have smartphones and the internet was just coming online, that's what I believe you know, is, in, is the potential that we have as we look to capitalize on technology in each of our businesses. And that's what I'll describe real briefly. And the other thing I'd say is that in a very uncertain world with a lot of the things that I just talked about, the theme that I hear from, the, you know, from a lot of the companies that I work with and executives I talk to is that technology really is one of the certainties that you can count on in an uncertain world. 
You may not know where inflation's going or unemployment or you know, energy prices or energy supply, but you can, pretty, you can, pretty, you can dial in pretty uh, clearly to what's happening with technology. And I'd ask, I'd ask you to think about that because that idea of you know, depending on the predictable advance in technology to give your business greater resilience is one of the core themes that I'll talk about. So I'm gonna hit these five really quickly. And uh, I'll start with the first, what we call the five, the first of the five forces, which is total enterprise reinvention. I'm going to keep this pretty short because you heard some great stories uh, from Safra and the other keynote presenters this morning. Total enterprise reinvention is the next stage of what's coming with digital. You know, we've been, and I'll talk about this more in a minute, but we've been at this digital revolution now for about 10 years in most of, you know, most of the companies that, uh, that we all represent. And, uh, but we're only, when I talk to executives and we look at the progress, we're probably only about a quarter of the way through that journey to really reinvent enterprises with technology. And over the next decade, the power of the new technology, all, a lot of the things we heard about this morning from Oracle are allowing us to take bigger and next steps in reinventing the enterprise. Uh, and uh, it's things like the cloud and the ongoing power of the cloud uh, to continue to power your know, business, the Oracle cloud in, uh, in many ways. And if you think about it, the cloud becomes the the new way of thinking about the operating system for your business. You know, the cloud is the operating system for business. Then you can think about data and AI, which uh, we heard a lot about this morning, as powering the next set of insights and intelligence in business. And then things like the metaverse that I'll, di that I'll dive into, uh, enabling the next generation of products and experiences uh, in, the, uh, in the enterprise. And that idea of total enterprise reinvention, I think, is, what, is the journey many of you are on at your companies. And, uh, but the pace of this will accelerate, and the winner will really be the ones that really can adapt to the technology more rapidly. And Emma and uh, Amir are going to talk about this one a little bit later, so I won't talk about it uh, more now. So that's force one and what a lot of us are focused on today. Force two is, is uh, focused on talent. And we believe that talent will be a key differentiator for companies over the next decade. It may seem like an obvious statement, but a lot of companies aren't yet acting in a way you know, that recognizes the role that talent will play. There, there, there'll continue to be talent shortages that we already see in a lot of uh, the economies. Clearly, uh, shortages in IT and technology talent. And the, the way that companies capitalize on talent and become talent creators, you know, creating new talent uh, rather than just going out trying to hire the skills that you need. So becoming a talent creator, becoming a learning organization so that your employees are learning the next set of skills they need, not just the current set. And then focusing on democratization of technology so you're creating more technology-enabled workers across your organizations. It's these things that we believe will really set the leaders apart in the next, uh, in the next decade. Those that really have intentional strategies around utilizing and developing talent in different ways. And again, technology is at the center of how you do this. Then the third force is sustainability, maybe an obvious one. Again, we heard about this a little bit this morning already. Um, Oracle's got a, you know, a big focus on sustainable technology in the, the cloud and elsewhere. But sustainability is a big priority, I think, for all of us in the room because of the, the way that sustainability and the technology agenda connect together. We did a study recently of most, you know, included most large companies around the world, and only 7% of companies, only 7% are connecting their technology strategy and their sustainability strategy. And we think that's a big mix, a, bi a big miss, because for two reasons. One is technology, in many cases, is the solution to sustainability challenge, uh, ch challenges that we face. Think about things like a water reclamation powered by better sense sensing and understanding how you're using you know, water and natural resources, or emissions tracking technology for methane using new and novel ways, satellite imagery and sensors and, uh, and uh, other technology to track things. Many, many examples of how technology provides the answers and it needs to be integrated with the technology strategy. And also, there's a big priority on, on sustainabil sustainability in technology. Uh, if you look at the amount of global emissions generated by technology today, it's about 4%. So 4% of carbon emissions are because of technology. That's triple 15 years ago when it was 1.5%. 
And if you look at the projection going forward, it's projected to triple again in the next 15 years to around 13%, which would be catastrophic if that actually does happen. So there's an obligation that we all have in, uh, work in uh, Oracle and technology companies are, that have and are acting on to make sure we're driving sustainable use in technology. And I'd encourage you to really focus on, on this more and look at things like the Green Software Foundation that we and other technology companies started to look at how we inject more sustainability in technology. So that's a key, a key priority. And then that takes us to the metaverse. And uh, you know, I said that this is you know, one, of, one of the most misunderstood technologies today. So I'd ask you just to kind of listen and think about how this might impact your business as we go forward. And um, maybe just, just to get into it, you know, to think about some metaverse scenarios, maybe just you know, sit back and think about you know, a couple scenarios for the future. Imagine if you know, you could, instead of just viewing an annual report of a company and flipping through the pages or clicking on a website, what if you could go to the boardroom of the company and interact with executives of the company, ask questions and understand what's happening, and then hit a button and pop out to a manufacturing plant and understand how they're, you know, managing efficiency and operations and what they're doing, and then hit another button and pop into a store and see how the consumers are interacting with their products. You know, that's not just the future. Some elements of that are happening today, and that will happen as you look forward. And that's the power of the metaverse and the technologies coming together. Or the other example on the screen where you see a worker in a turban, what if you could have a digital twin of your real-time operations? You had workers that had both the digital twin and augmented reality, so they could go maintain the equipment in real time using augmented reality, pop back to the digital twin, understand and simulate the impact on performance and adjust the real-time operating characteristics. Again, things like this are happening already. It'll become more you know, common uh, in the future, and that's the power of the metaverse extended into the way that we do business. And I'll talk about some other examples in a minute, but a um, key thing to, to understand is that this really does drive the next generation of experiences. I mentioned this earlier, but about 10 years ago in 2013, when I was giving talks like this, I was talking about this idea that every business would become a digital business. And at the time, that was a provocative idea. People didn't really believe that was going to happen. But uh, you know, now we're at a stage where we don't question that. We are really on this relentless you know, mission to turn all of our companies into digital businesses. The metaverse and the technologies around it represent an even bigger step up and an even bigger potential and a bigger change in what it means to be a digital business, which is why I believe that the changes that we see going forward from today in using the metaverse and, uh, and these technologies will be greater than the change that you've all introduced into your organizations to date. So the bigger change of really uh, being fully digital, leveraging the metaverse is still to come. And that may be a little bit provocative because, uh, because of the way we think about the metaverse. But let's, let's step back and look at some things that are happening out there. You know, Nike has uh, 21 million visitors in their Nike land, you know, their metaverse that they've created. J.P. Morgan Chase opened their banking branch in uh, Decentraland. And uh, Decentraland themselves just launched the first aut automated teller machine in the metaverse. Uh, Lego introducing the kid-friendly metaverse. Uh, many other examples you see up here. And things like Citigroup talking about this being a $13 trillion uh, market by 2030, $13 trillion market by 2030, that's about a sixth, one sixth of global GDP that Citigroup believes will be uh, impacted and part of the metaverse economy. So it just gives you the size that they think it is in that case. Now, why, why is this happening? And this is why I believe this will and this is impacting our businesses today and is inevitable in a, in a lot of respects because this is really an evolution of technology that's happening, driven by Oracle, driven by many other companies. And uh, if you think back on it, Web1 was the Internet of Data. This was HTTP and FTP and Search, and Google was the dominant technology and kind of winner of Web1. Then in Web2, we had mobile access. We had social and, uh, and the like come on. The social companies, sharing economy companies, became the dominant companies of Web2. Now we have Web3, and I would argue that the Web3 capabilities around Internet of Ownership and Internet, Internet of Place are bigger disruptions than what we saw in Web1 and Web2. The Internet of Ownership uh, enabling uh, verifiable, provable, distinct digital identity and access for individuals and products. Sounds pretty easy, but that's, that's a breakthrough capability that, doesn't, that didn't exist a few years ago that exists now in the form of blockchain and distributed ledgers enabled by the cloud and the internet, enabling things like cryptocurrency, but more interestingly, enabling fiat digital currencies. 
105 of the world's central banks, representing 95% of global currency, are working on their blockchain-enabled digital currencies at, at uh, different paces. Oracle has their uh, blockchain product that's powering companies, you know, allowing companies to create distinct products like Decathlon, powered by you know, distinct digital access uh, in, in distributed ledger technology. This is very different than what can exist today. And as you look at new technology movements like the Open Wallet Foundation, which is standardizing identity and standardizing avatar access and standardizing the way tokenized products can work uh, across the internet, that will be breakthrough capability as, as fundamental and foundational as anything we've seen in Web 1 and Web 2 and even bigger. And then the internet of place, is uh, again taking it to another, it you know, uh, putting a new capability in place. The idea that you can have persistent shared experiences in the, you know, in one place in the internet together, and this is what you see in the metaverse environments. So these two capabilities are happening and will happen, which is why, as businesses, we need to understand what's happening. Now. One the, if you think about what I'm saying, I'm probably describing this differently than you think about the metaverse today, and I'd ask you to think about the metaverse and reframe it in your minds as you think about your business strategy going forward. It's not just about the consumers and, and uh, Roblox and Minecraft and these things. It's about business and how we use it. It's about the future of work and how we transform it, as you can see in some of the recent announcements that have happened. It's not just about re uh, virtual. It's about reality, like the worker example I gave earlier, and bridging the two. And in, in essence, the metaverse makes real experiences more powerful, and that's the way we need to think about it in our businesses. It's not just about the headsets and the 3D immersive experiences. The 2D of how you can use it on your phones and PCs is incredibly important and, and gives a much, uh, much uh, broader set of the population access to metaverse experiences. So you need to think about 2D and 3D. And it's a continuum of technologies from now to the future as it evolves. So think about framing it in that way as you look at the potential. And if you do that, I think you'll find that the metaverse impacts every part of every business, and that's what we believe is happening already today. I already talked about payments, you know, metaverse in, in the form of uh, new payment structures from crypto to fiat digital currencies, and stablecoins is already transforming payments, and we'll do so on a bigger scale as we go. Customer experience I've already given examples of. Uh, companies like Pearson, who just, uh, the, the uh, educational publisher who's introducing non-fungible tokens for textbooks, a new way of learning powered by the metaverse and, uh, and the technologies. Employee experience, uh, Accenture has onboarded 150,000 of our employees over the last 12 months using the metaverse, using headsets in this case, bringing them to a virtual world to do common training, establish common culture, and, and get uh, familiar with, the, with our company and onboard them. Tremendously effective, better employee engagement, better experience for our people. The products you make, I've given some examples uh, of this already, like uh, Pearson, new textbooks, Nike, Crypto Kicks, Gucci, you know, with their uh, digital purses and such. And the reality is that the, these new products are digital products that allow you to create customer relationships in ways you can't in the internet or with mobile applications today. So th these new products are creating powerful new opportunities for relationships. How you make products, digital twins, the industrial metaverse we believe is where we're gonna see some of the biggest potential of the metaverse, like the worker example that I gave, like BMW who's uh, building digital twins of their factories, like Mars who's injecting you know, digital twin and metaverse technologies into their supply chain. And finally, uh, enterprise management, that's uh, just what I just clicked off of. It's the idea you actually manage your business as a metaverse and think about your ability to think about your business as a digital twin and create virtual experiences around managing and running your business. We believe this is the ultimate uh, landing point of where we'll get to with the metaverse. But you need to do this resp with responsibility in mind. So privacy and trust become very important. Uh, safety is important so that you're thinking about uh, wellness implications. Not everybody can use these headsets for a long period of time. We need to think about physical wellness, mental wellness, and well-being, access uh, by children to content and such. A lot of things to think about there. And sustainability to make sure we're using sustainable blockchain technologies rather than inefficient proof-of-work uh, proof mining technologies in, uh, in implementing the metaverse as we go. And we, again, we heard some of, some of that in the keynote about more sustainable access to technologies for some of these applications. And uh, you know, we, we all, as, as leaders in applying this to our business, have the obligation to apply these technologies in a responsible way as we look at the future. And uh, there's a lot of work we're doing in this area, if you're interested, to pull together multiple stakeholders to make sure we do build a responsible metaverse that, that operates in the way that we all wanted to in creating the right type of human-centric future as we build out the metaverse together.
Now that was all the metaverse, uh, but it doesn't stop there. And uh, I would just leave you with this. I'm going to go through this quickly. But um, everything we just talked about, including the metaverse, is in the bottom left of this little framework. It's all about the digital technology, the 70 years since we invented the transistor and all the digital technology that's transforming our business. Well, there's new things happening. And let me just describe three quick examples. Computing the impossible is new forms of computing, non-silicon based, like quantum computing or biocomputing, which have uh, tremendous power. I'm sure all of you have read a little bit about quantum computing. We're applying this today with companies in drug discovery, quantum chemistry, which was mentioned on stage this morning, in uh, wealth management, portfolio management, and financial services and other areas. And it's got tremendous security implications. This is a technology I'd say you need to start understanding in your business today that wouldn't put it off to the future. Science, techno uh, uh, science technology is about uh, some of the, again, some of the examples we heard on stage this morning, the digital technology moving from IT, information technology, to OT, which is manufacturing and in the plants, which is what a lot of us are doing, that's where digital twins come in, to ST, which is technology, digital technology, powering new ways to do uh, uh, biology, synthetic biology, material science, materials discovery and such. And the work that we all do and you all do in technology is transforming the ways we do fundamental science and R&D and other processes which are really critical in driving the innovation a lot of industries going forward. And the, the markets for this and the areas of your business impacted by ST will be bigger than IT and OT as you look at the markets going forward. And then finally, they say space is the final frontier, so I'll end on space technology. Uh, but uh, this is something that's very relevant for a lot of your industries. This is about space-to-space -space technology, satellite-to-satellite -satellite payment infrastructures that we're starting to work on with some companies, space-to-earth technologies, uh, planetary imaging, and the like to, uh, you know, from satellites to uh, provide new types of services, and also earth-to-space technology, doing experimentation and other things in space and zero-gravity environments that, uh, again, is uh, something very important for many for many applications. So to wrap this up, you know, I think the, uh, you know, the message I leave you with is that every company really does become a tech company. Jensen, again, made, the, made this point on stage this morning, because the way you're using technology really does inform how you move forward, and the technology is going to move faster than it has, you know, if you look, uh, looking backward. The inflection points are really big and are going to be disruptive. The winners in metaverse won't necessarily be the, the winners in the digital revolution to date. And the way you think about talent and the ecosystem of partners to put this together is going to be really important to your success. So I'll just leave you with this one quote, uh, which I love, which is, uh, let us return not to what was normal, but reach for what is next. And as you think about the future, as you think about moving past some of the challenges in the world that we have today, moving past the pandemic, really the, what's, what's next is tremendously exciting and is, uh, has uh, great potential for all of our businesses and where we take things next. So I'd leave you on that thought, but I've talked about a lot, so I thought it'd be good to show you something right now. So who wants to see a little bit about the metaverse? Should we dive in and see it? Okay. So, uh, so as a bridge, and as we go from tomorrow to today, let's, uh, let's go into the metaverse. I'm going to go in there, and uh, we'll see what we find in there, and we'll uh, come back in a little bit. So let's go to the metaverse. Welcome to Accenture's Nth Floor, what we believe to be the largest enterprise metaverse in the world. Right now, we're standing in one Accenture park. In this virtual space, and others like our Accenture Lounge, have executives, clients, and partners meet. And this year, we've already held hundreds of meetings here and in many spaces like it in the nth floor. And one of the fun things that happens here is I often see our own Accenture colleagues, including Emma McGuigan. Hi, Emma. Hey, Paul. How are you? It's great to see you, Paul. And I know you've been telling our friends at Oracle about how we're using the metaverse. Have you really told them about how our people are engaging? No, that's a really good point. And we actually use the nth floor for talent development and creation in many ways. In fact, we've onboarded about 150,000 new hires through our metaverse over the past year, which is really exciting and has had amazing results. And in fact, our research has found that engagement and learning actually improves with the virtual experiences. And they can work virtually in many of our spaces in digital twins. We can meet and complete research in any one of more than 20 digital twins of our offices and our labs and our coffee shops. <laughs> exactly. And that's why we've claimed our own space in the metaverse and are already helping dozens of clients and more every day stake out their own claim in the metaverse. 
And we're doing this by establishing trust and creating a diverse community to make sure we create a responsible metaverse from the start, which is really important. A metaverse where we can meet, we can play, have a little fun, and just sit down and have a cup of coffee. Can I get one for you? Oh, you're good, thanks. I can get it because I have my Discover card with me. In fact, I need to get back to reality to talk with Namir Aruni, who has a lot to tell us about Discover's digital transformation. Discover really strikes a balance between enterprise reinvention and bold innovation because a fundamental aspect is their strategy for managing their wide range of applications. Well, that's great. And what happens in the metaverse not stay in the metaverse. So on that note, let's get back to the conversation in the real world, learn some more. Wow. It's good to be back in the physical world and I feel it's gonna be slightly less cheesy in the physical world as well. Um, so I'm Emma McGuigan and I run our uh, Accenture's Intelligent Platform Services, which includes all the work that we do with partners like Oracle. Paul just gave you a great, if speedy, run through the five forces of change and our technology vision. Well, I'm going to focus a lot more on total enterprise reinvention, that first force, and thinking about how we can drive that at an accelerated pace through compressed transformation. It's all about cloud data and the pace at which we can drive, you know, you may unlock the power of AI. And Oracle as a partner of ours is really well placed to help us do that. But this, this journey starts with this creation of a digital core and connecting it together and then allowing us to think about how we can plug and play other applications into that while sharing data. And when we share that data, we can unlock the value even faster. As I mentioned in the metaverse, and yes, what's, what's said in the metaverse doesn't stay in the metaverse, it's not like Vegas, but uh, we're gonna be talking, I'm gonna be inviting um, Amira Rooney from Discover to come and share their story, and we listened to that, and they've been able to go through a tremendous rapid transformation of their finance operations within less than two years, which let's be honest, we used to think was, un was unachievable. But before we do that, I just want to spend a little bit of time sharing some research with you to really help explore how we believe compressed transformation can, be, can really come to life with Oracle and provide some insights how interoperability is helping make that possible. So we've been doing some research and uh, over the last couple of years, we've been studying a whole range of organizations, some of our clients, some are not, and really analyzing how they think about their application portfolio, how they think about their relationships, how they think about how they interact their different applications together. And what we've seen is when we looked at this wide swathe of, of, of enterprises over two years, is they fall into th broadly three fairly equal sized categories. The first are the ones who've chosen not to expand their application footprint. They've neither decreased nor increased the interoperability between those applications. And they're, they're stuck in what you might call technology status with only 1% revenue growth. If we move up the chain to the next third, they've been really powerful at expanding their application footprint. And they're seeing 4% revenue growth. But where I want us to focus is on the top group, the highest performers, experiencing more than six times the revenue growth of that first group. They're both investing in their application landscape, they're investing in interoperability, and they're taking their people and their organization with them, really thinking about how they can connect those applications together. What we think about in that world is, what does that do? It's more than just the revenue growth. Why the revenue growth? Well, if you move into that world of thinking about having connected apps and unlocking that value of having that cloud-based core that unlocks the, 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 the power of data and AI, you're better placed to reinvent customer experience. 16 percentage points better. You're more efficient at improving your operational your operational processes and your supply chain operations, 12 percentage points better. And you're more likely to, you're, you're better placed to adopt new technologies and to transform to new business models, 
you know, 11 percentage points greater. These are really big numbers when you start to think about the, the, the need to drive an accelerated pace of transformation. So our little, our little between us, there's five things we think you need to think about. The one is you need to start anew, and we need to stop trying to band-aid across some of our legacy applications that we've been running with for decades. The second thing is to use cloud as the foundation. We heard through the keynote this morning, we heard people like Diane talking with Safra about needing to you know, go fast and be bold and to drive towards that cloud foundation and to do it and execute and keep running again. We've heard, and we talk a lot about the, the opportunity that all of that cloud gives us around plug and play applications with modular applications and modular architectures. Oracle have been leading on this amongst many of their competitors to really think about how they can open the door to that. And then we, as the enterprises, can unlock some of those niche providers to think about how they can support specific solutions within key uh, industries that we operate in or, and help manage some of the jurisdiction issues that we manage. But it's all about people. It's about helping drive collaboration and eliminating the silos so that people don't defend their data, they share their data. So our finance organizations can understand how the decisions they make impact their colleagues in supply chain or in HR so that people want to share and work together and eliminating the silos so we have shared success. And the only way for, and all of these other four happen, is through leading from the top. We need change makers leading. I, had a I was with a client last week who, before the pandemic, she, she's the digital product owner for a fast food organized chain, that, that, a global fast food chain. And they, she went, presented to the executive board, including the CEO, and said, 50% of our customers are gonna come through a digital channel. She made that statement before the pandemic. The CEO went, brilliant, this is great. The rest of the exec board went, what on earth are you talking about? We're a fast food outlet. Today, they, they, of course, that was a month before the pandemic hit, we all went into lockdown and 80% of their customers started coming through digital channel. Today, they're back to 40%. It's that type of boldness and vision and that ability to change and be a leader in the change makers that brings this to life. And I'm delighted to say we're going to share this with Amir Aruni, who is a change maker and has really helped lead from the top and influence the organization at Discover. So please join me in welcoming Amir on stage. Hey, thank you. So Amir, thank you so much for joining me today, and I'm so happy that you're going to share with us a little bit of your story. But do you want to start with a little bit of an introduction to Discover and the journey you've been on? Thank you. So Emma, let me just thank you for inviting me on the stage and representing Discover, which is a fantastic company. I'm working now three years with Discover. Start just my uh, work with Discover before the pandemic. And probably you know Discover because uh, most of you hopefully have such a card in your packet, right? Discover card. But Discover is much more than just credit card. It is a leading direct consumer banking uh, company with uh, products uh, for consumer bankers, consumer uh, retail consumers, but also a large part of Discover is payment services. Discover provides payment services in 185 countries outside of the US, but the credit card and the banking uh, products are based in the US market. So when you hear actually the Discover, then you think about a company which is not having a branches. The model which we have is a direct model and the step from a direct model into digital uh, area is actually something which we are doing right now more and more with our team to shift from a batch-oriented environment, which is probably the case for many corporate environments, into a real online environment. And to do that, we started a journey, a transformation journey, um, based on the culture which we have at Discover. And that culture starts with collaboration that is really in the heart of every employee at Discover. At the same time, we saw opportunities for growth and accelerating growth. 
and to shift and get to that level, we started a program which we call Runway, a three years program. And that program aimed actually to eliminate all of manual activities which we have, shifting into, uh, into automation, but also into one of the big elements which Paul just talked about, which was the talent. And when I'm talking about talent, is not just going to the market and hiring talent, but also creating an opportunity in the organization to create talent. And uh, one, of, uh, uh, one of our initiatives, which I'm really very, very passionate about, is creating a Discovered Technology Academy. I call it a place from engineers for engineers. And it became really a place where we reward engineering culture at Discover. So that's actually our start of the journey at Discover. And uh, I'm uh, very pleased to uh, share more of that with you today. Thank you very much. And uh, we're going to come back to the people, because I know you're really passionate about the people. But let's talk a little bit about, you had a big multi-platform environment and a journey around transformation on that. Can you share some lessons learned with, with people in the audience here of some of what you, you learned on that transformation? Oh, yeah, Emma. Let me just say, when I came to Discover, the first uh, impression was uh, close to a lot of good things which we have at Discover was the level of complexity. And that complexity was in terms of platforms and technology, but also complexity in processes and complexity in how we collaborated in the company together. So the first step, and I think uh, maybe one of the lesson learned I want to share with my colleagues in this room, is acknowledging of the situation at that time. Um, that level of complexity uh, has a reason. And, and, and I started with my team to acknowledge that reason. Why we are actually so successful at Discover? Because we had a siloed business in the past. And because the business was so siloed, we were able to get m most of the benefit of each solution. When we wanted to build something, we went and built that product and brought it actually as soon as possible to market. That's why Discover is so famous and now well-known name in the industry. I mean, who came with the first concept of cashback in the industry, in the card industry? And that was Discover. And I can tell you a lot of those examples. All those examples was based on the siloed environment which we had. That was what made us successful in the past, Emma. And, and, and our conclusion was what has been successful in the past is not going to be successful in future. So now we need to break those silos. And that is very difficult. Can you imagine? You have a lot of elements in your environment which has been making, making you successful. And now you need to break that. So you go through a communication part understanding and conviction, talk, talk to different stakeholders to, to say to them that if you are living in a digital era, having one customer data view is a must, right? You cannot have a customer who has a savings product and payments product or loans product and ask them twice to fill in their, uh, their, their customer day, their data. That is not done at the era of digital. So what was in the past those silos and those multiple source of data needed to get into consolidated data. And you know, this, this, these are not projects which you do just in a few months. You need to have understanding and conviction mm -hmm. in your organization. You need to have long-term support for your journey. And we started to do some of those elements to deal with complexity. Another element of, uh, of, of dealing with complexity was shifting really from manual activities into automation. Because it was not just automating of what we did in the past, mm -hmm. but going and, 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 and simplifying first that processes. And after simplification, putting a question mark, is this process needed? If the answer is yes, we are going to automate. And if it's not needed, we are going to eliminate that. Now that process of automation was another Another big, uh, big element uh, when it comes to complexity and dealing with, uh, with, with platforms. And we made a decision to renew some of our core environments. Mm -hmm. That is the third, actually, element in terms of removing the complexity. And again, Amad, this is a long journey, multiple year, 
and needs multiple commit year commitment of of executive team and the board to get there. But uh, we are on a very, very good way. And you're unlocking value pretty quickly, which I find really impressive. So, so when you think about that breaking down silos, that driving the automation, the replacing of those core platforms, that requires a lot of human change. There's a lot of people who need to be sw persuaded this is the way to go and that the, the the message that, you know, take the bold step that what got you to here is not going to take you forward. Yeah. What do you think, what, what are the key things that you did when you think about your own team and then across the organizations, the key things that you did to help take Discover on that journey so that they all got behind the changes? That is a very good question, Emma, because I said that the Discover culture was based on collaboration. That is a fantastic foundation to yeah. build on. So everything which we did after was based on that good foundation. And, um, and recognition of that, that good culture was actually the start. So our strategy was we need to do a lot in terms of technology. And mm -hmm. that is our technology innovation program. We need to do a lot in terms of automation. We need to do a lot in terms of governance and how, uh, how, we, how we fund actually different initiatives. But the most important element is we need to shift into a new way of working. A new way of working where collaboration is not just a word or behavior, but it is embedded in everything which you do every mm -hmm. day. That's why we shifted from so-called project-oriented organization into product-oriented organization. And I started to build multidisciplinary team, consist of the business, uh, the technologists and engineers, but also the marketeers. So they can have the whole ownership of a product during the whole life cycle of product. And when, when I'm talking about life cycle of product, I'm talking about the moment that you think about it, so ideation, into the moment that you design, build, and run. Suppose you have one team consist of your business colleagues, your marketing colleagues, your engineers, and those are involved from day one in the ideation, the ideation of the product to build, design, to design, build, and run. That collective team take the whole ownership of that product. And that is actually the level of collaboration which brought in day-to-day mm -hmm. -day activity, I must say. That is changing, actually, the whole operating model of the company. Yeah, because then you, uh, you break down those silos by doing, not by saying or even leading you. It's by the way you do, right? Putting ownership responsibility at the place where it is. Some of uh, my team members are today here, and, and uh, I know that they have a lot of joy by this way of working, because this is not the business ask to do this, and the technology guys are doing that. That is not blaming each other when things go wrong or aiming just for success slow, silo-ly. When you put them all together and you give them actually the opportunity of yeah. uh, taking the whole ownership, you will see a total different dynamic in your team and organization. And that has even helped us during the pandemic and the, and the, and the and the large attrition period mm -hmm. of time which we had, we were very successful at Discover because of that shift to a new way of working which encouraged collaboration and give real ownership to the team. Um, there is a lot to gain on that area, I think, in many of, uh, of, of, of your companies. So one very quick last question. We've got a couple of minutes left. When you think about how the enterprise platform partners, I know you work with Oracle and others, how do they, how have they helped you on this journey? Um, I, I think there's a whole lot to be said about the open architectures we're seeing within the enterprise application landscape today, but are there any particular things you'd like to, to call out just before we close? Oh yeah, you know, the, in today's world, we are not able to do everything ourselves. So success means collaboration and collaboration internally within your own organization but also with your uh, long-term uh, partners, which Oracle is one of them. So I can say a lot. Number one is um, I learned to express to my organization that we need to use full of functionality of any solution. So giving you just one example, we have now implemented Oracle Fusion for uh, uh, finance. 
So replacing our general ledger. And general ledger at Discover was a solution which has been built 30 years ago, 3.0. I'm not joking with you, that's really 3.0. And when we went actually through that functionality, a lot of my engineers need to go to the code to understand what was the functionality, <laughs> because there was no co documentation even. I think I'm talking about some of the elements which probably part of your corporate environment too. So when we talk about building new solution, we made one agreement uh, with Accenture, which was actually our partner in terms of integration, and with Oracle, which provided the package, that we are going to reduce the amount of customization to zero. And from experience of the past in my previous jobs, I knew that was very, very difficult. So we spent a lot of time to talk about it. And, and the product is already in, 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 in production uh, for, uh, for nearly a year, and we did zero customization in that area. I think that was one of the most important element which we could get through collaboration with Accenture, with Oracle, our own engineers, but also a very close collaboration with our finance colleagues because they were ready to change the chart of account instead of doing some custom yeah, yeah, yeah. in the product. And that is one of the biggest lesson learned which I want to share with all of you. Well, that is a brilliant lesson to finish on because it's one of the hardest things to do to go from customization to none. Amir, thank you so much for your partnership and thank you for joining me on stage. You're thank welcome. you very much. Very nice. And thank you to all of you for listening. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you.